First, let's disabuse you of one notion. We're not a yacht club or a sailing club. Second, uh, we have a short period of time for the sailing club and the rowing association before Alan from the Saratoga Lake Association commits the main body of what we're going to try to talk about today. I'd like to concentrate on the sailing club's clubhouse because it goes way back in the history of Saratoga Lake. It's at a place called Turtle Cove. You know it as Manning's Cove. It was owned by William Manning, Troy businessman, 1867 through 1931. He was a member, he was an industrialist, he was a businessman, he went to RPI. He was a Democrat, and he was actually the town supervisor of the town of Malta for two terms back, I believe, 1912, 1913. Paul Rose here, you can probably correct me on that. He was also um, active in democratic politics, was uh, invited to become the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury in the Woodward Earl Wilson administration, but preferred to come back to do what he wanted to do best, which was grow chickens. Raised chickens. It was a 300 acre piece of property on the west side of the lake going up to what is now Nelson Avenue Extension Valley. Raised, bred, and sold chickens. And that's the property that was known as Turtle Point Farm. If you're ever on the lake and you go down the west side, past the Cateros, past what is now Manning's Cove, you'll see a group of boats in the water. You'll see a big brown house. That brown house, as I said, is His uh, funeral actually was held at, on the lake at that farm in 1931. People from all over the country, from Washington, New York, as I said, exactly in democratic politics. The house, so the family didn't want to get into the farming, so they sold it to a family named Maylander, who owned Tough Like Plastics in Balsam Spa in the 40s. The club purchased it in 1973. I'm going to go back to that in a moment bought 12 acres for $110,000, and I, I couldn't dare tell you what it was just assessed for last year by the town of Malta. It's more than 110, I'll tell you that. We managed to purchase another 36 acres of land north of the current location from John Witt a number of years ago, 20 years ago. And then about, I believe it was two years ago, John Witt donated 159 acres to Saratoga Plan. This is the area from Drummond's Creek, if you know Manning's Cove at all, it's a property that goes up around the corner. So that property is going to remain suitable for passive recreation and almost forever while, because it's quite frankly quite swampy. Now, a little bit about the club, and I'm watching time because Alan has 8,000 slides he wants to show you, and the main is going to go to. The club was started in 1957. That's why I wear shirts. 57. Originally, it was at the Cater Ross Park, the amusement park. It was a small garage down on the shore. It was dedicated to, and it still is, to small boats. One design racing. Thistles, Flying Scots, Ensigns, Jets. At that time, International 14. Membership was geared to that. And we have the greater capital district, large, relatively scientific community that gets into the uh, physics of sailing. In fact, one of our members recently was a retired physics professor at SUNY Albany, published a book entitled The Physics of Sailing. So if you really want some enlightening reading that will keep you up all night, I suggest John Kimball, The Physics of Sailing. Having said that, um, a couple more notes about the club. As I said, we, were, we started with 20 families. And it grew in the, in, in the 60s, over 100 families. The Mealander property became available in 1972. It was for, they offered 300 acres, 3,000 feet of waterfront for $155,000. My gosh. Club couldn't afford it. So after much negotiation, bought 12 acres. As I said, a road easement up to Nelson Ave Extension, about 600 feet of waterfront for 110. Members uh, took out a mortgage for $70,000 and signed a group of personal bonds, personal notes. The remainder reduced went to a stunning $150 a year. And a number of people didn't like that, 
So they left to form a group called the Saratoga, uh, the Kateros Sailing Association. It, it, it foundered after a few years, and most of the folks came home to Saratoga Lake. Currently, we've got over 1,000 feet, 175 families. We offer one design racing in seven different uh, categories of boats, as plus open. If you're ever on the lake on a Sunday afternoon and you look out at all those sails and say, oh, that looks so peaceful as people going around in buoys, it is peaceful until you get close and you realize that competition is competition and boat words uh, are marvelous to hear. Well, we offer sailing lessons throughout the year. We have a sailing school. I think I saw Mark Welker from the sailing school in the audience for both adults and children as well as private lessons. Helped build the sport of sailing, we proudly say, with just a little bit of ego, that we're the other great racing in Saratoga. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Turtle Cove, as it was called, there are still turtles in Manning's Cove. And anytime you wish, uh, if you want to see that lovely old house and the beautiful woodwork in it that goes back to the turn of the century, Nelson Ave extension onto Manning Road, there's a blue sign. Looks like a, a seahorse on it. Drive down, down the road and say, how long is this road? Because it's a half a mile. Mm -hmm. And take a look around. Introduce yourself and any one of the members would be glad to show you the property. So, thank you so much. I'd like to turn it over to Lorraine to talk about some of the other great uh, activity on the lake. Thank you, Rowan.
build a railroad track to Springfield just so people could get to the, Saratoga, or to the college grounds. Fellow athlete and publisher James Gordon Bennett next to him, who in the end becomes kind of a richest to rags guy, is famous for creating events to sell papers. These, this group don't so much want to finance the college regattas. They want, but they know that the regattas can finance their enterprises. So, Morrissey knows he has the perfect venue, and he makes it happen. In 1871, he puts together a group of respectable town businessmen, the bank, to fund and organize a prom regatta. As a target of prejudice most of his life, just like on the track association, Morris is very careful to keep his name off the official association. 1871, they draw the professionals with a $5,000 purse to Saratoga and race for the first time on Saratoga Lake. <coughs> to keep the town happy, uh, they try and reduce the gambling, but it doesn't work. And they're there selling pools based on statistics that they haven't really figured out yet how to predict the winners of the regatta. So they kind of wrote it up like they wrote the horse itself. Track. But you can see Dr. Underwood, who sells pools for all of the tracks in New York State, was also here selling these pools for the growing regatta. Anyhow, it's a big success. And in 1873, though, they took to hard some of the comments from the town to try to reduce the gambling. So they went to the amateurs for the races. And, but they just took the $5,000 purse and bought tr silver trophies, goblets, and cups to give away his prizes. And you can see Frank Leslie's here. Everybody's interested in what this growing is. And he's actually published a guide to the styles of growing so that people can talk about it. And here's some images. You can see Frank Leslie's um, mansion on the hill. Here's the finish line. They built a grandstand that could help 2,000 people. So based on the success of these regattas, they were awarded the 1874 Growing Association of American Colleges College Regatta. These guys were racing straight sixes, and if you know anything about growing, it's an incredibly fast boat, six oars, and the guy that's steering can't see where they're going. And so already the Growing Association of American Colleges were starting to talk about you can see the list underneath on the left that uh, they gave to the SRA as their marching orders for the regatta. They wanted uh, no, uh, no gouging of the visitors, they wanted them to improve the telegraph facilities, the finish line, and they complied with everything. And they pulled off a successful race, uh, which you can see that Columbia won, which is a little bit of a surprise, but a lot of it was due to the fact that Harvard and Yale were placed next to each other in lane and almost continuously fall foul each other throughout the race. <laughs> but the bookies loved the college regattas. Look at all the statistics they had. They had the age of the rowers. They had their height, their weight unclothed, and their weight unclothed. <laughs> they had their natural chest, and they had their inflated chest. <laughs> they had the, the, all the statistics about the boat. And then finally, they had uh, a little paragraph about what each college was going to be wearing so that people from afar could actually tell which boat belonged to which. They didn't have bow numbers on the boats until the next year. So you can see here that Harvard was going to be wearing four red handkerchiefs, but they'd be naked to the waist and possibly wearing white drawers. <laughs> it was a huge success. And the, the town, the gamblers, everybody really enjoyed it. But if you look at this trophy from uh, Frank, that was donated by Frank Leslie, and I could just see Morrissey going around town strong arming everybody into donating silver trophies. <laughs> this, this was actually saved for the next race, which they had a month later for the amateurs in town. And they had a huge crowd after the track season closed as well. Based on this success, they got the 1875 regatta, and this is the big one. 40,000 visitors come up to Saratoga on Vanderbilt's railroads. We've got the lake. We've got 13 new boathouses built just for each college team. All the rowers came. 13 colleges were. They had little 
trouble with transportation to Italy. <laughs> a little more trouble on the way back. And the hotels actually had to throw mattresses on the floors of the hallways to accommodate all the extra visitors. But they had three grand balls the evening of the races and original music for that. And most importantly, Bennett had his headline. The farmers from Cornell rocked the college world by beating the Harvard men. Saratoga Lake and the race. 
Now, Tanak didn't make it because his wife got sick. But I love this because this is like the you know the master's category for growing now is all divided up into categories that we race in. I think this is like the first H slash I category race ever done, probably in the world. And uh, Riley actually continued to grow after that uh, so for about three more years, and he died in 1927. 1963, someone remembered that growing and race and the horse racing were intimately associated in the early days. And so for the anniversary of the track, the centenary of the track, Saratoga Lake hosts the American Henley Regatta again, June 8th. A successful regatta with 16 races. But if you look, it looks like the clock is kind of ticking down on growing in terms of public interest. Because even though the rowing is growing, there's more racers, there's more boats in every regatta, it's spread across the nation. The colleges have come back together, but we still don't have the, the public interest anymore. And what happened? And this is just, we're going to look at the data now. On the left is the Philadelphia Athletics, and on the right is the Columbia Crew, both from 1874. The chart below it depicts the number of articles in the New York Times per year on baseball and growing. So if you look in 1875, I have to look at my numbers here, there are 14 articles about baseball, 125 on growing. In 1876, the National League forms, and it bumps them up to 20 articles about baseball. But growing is still 163. In 1882, something happens. Does anyone know what that is? The American Association forms. They slash ticket prices for baseball games. Competition goes up. And within two years, the New York Times is publishing 340 articles a year about baseball. And we're down to 60 of our own. And even in the Olympic year now, looking at 2000, there are only 19 articles about growing, over 5,000 about baseball. Now you could say maybe it was a benefit because, or a blessing, because rowing got to develop as a sport without the intense commercial in influence that um, football and baseball has But let's go to now, we have Skidmore College. Uh, they started in 1978 uh, as a club team and eventually become the NCAA Division III. Currently, row on the boathouse in Fish Creek. It's missing its sign because they're going to start construction on their new boathouse. They also have a community rowing program that's for the college. Saratoga so Springs Rowing Club, 1986. You can see who started it there. Uh, they used to row on the Waterfront Restaurant, which is now the wonderful city, Saratoga Springs City Park that Mary Epson mentioned. And they started the Head of the Fish. 64 boats in 1986, and now Head of the Fish hosts over 2,000 boats for its annual regatta every year, the last weekend of October. That's the, you can see a uh, poster from one of the races, Tom Frost is incredible, did incredible artwork for every race to advertise them, and in the middle there is the famous Fish Head Trophy, where when you win one of the Head of the Fish races, that's one thing. Kind of looks a little scary, but I can tell you as a rower that they are highly regarded in the rowing community and also highly coveted. But I don't know, maybe we did a few things better in the 1870s. <laughs> <laughs> and the current SRA started when nine high school students asked uh, their history teacher, Chris Chase, if they could go to rowing. And the club has grown to more than 300 members, and I'm not talking about business men anymore. These are actual rowers in the club, all different levels of clubs, scholastic, masters, adaptive, and all sorts of camps. And they host five regattas a year. And now we again are bringing back thousands of boats to Saratoga <laughs> Lake, and at least 20,000 visitors every year. The quote you see on the bottom is from the regatta which is a, a special paper published for the 1875 College Ramada. And it's a quote that the original SRA published about themselves that turned out to be curiously prophetic about the contemporary 
the Saratoga Rock Association. And it's really a nationally known organization, and it's especially associated with the fantastic work Adams they run here in Saratoga. Um, I was going to say, if anyone wants to take a picture of the bottom half, that's uh, how to contact your local rowing clubs or come out and watch a regatta. I'd like to thank the, list, the organizations listed there for helping to preserve the wonderful history that we have here in Saratoga Springs. Special thanks to Terry Blasco from the Saratoga Room for her very relevant uh, references and images, and Sarah Kellogg from SRA for the wonderful videos you've seen. So let's just quickly do a summary of what we of the progress growing has made on Saratoga Lake in the hundred plus years it's been around. This is an image of the start from the College Regatta of 1875 and the beautiful waters of Saratoga Lake. We have state boats holding the boats at the start. We have officials and chase boats that are going to follow them down a well buoyed course. And we have well trained athletes. <laughs> sleek racing shells that are headed towards the finish where thousands of their fans await them. Let's zoom in to now.
Now, the Mohawk um, Indians believed in the superstition. They believed that the lake stillness was sacred to the Great Spirit, and that if a human voice uttered a sound upon its waters, the canoe of the adventure would instantly sink. And there's, there's a poem and there's a lot of song about this, and there's an old legend about a woman went out in the boat and she was talking about the storm, and then somebody asked the chief why she didn't sink. And, he, and the chief replied, well, the Great Spirit understood that the woman couldn't help herself. <laughs> Now, 
about uh, transportation and recreation. Now, a lot of people didn't believe this, but we found some uh, you know, uh, contemporaneous documentation in terms of advertising. But the Lady of the Lake could accommodate 1,500 passengers and had three decks. It was built in 1881. Probably bigger than a lot of the big boats that you see up in uh, Lake George. And later on, that's the built boat you see on the bottom left. And then um, the Alice, which a lot of people know about, was exhibited in 1893 at the Chicago's World's Fair. It was named after Mrs. Thomas Luther, the <coughs> of the Luther Forest, and uh, we'll talk about him a little bit more. And I got just a real quick plug. I know Paul Perot, who is the, <coughs> the historian for the town of Malta, in next month's uh, round here, I think it's going to be all about Thomas Luther. So beginning in 1903, um, the Alice shuttled between the Cavers Park and the White Sulphur Springs Hotel, so you can go back and forth. Here's a couple of the um, advertisements for the Alice that you can see with the pictures here. We had moonlight excursions on the lake with the fireworks, and it was quite a uh, walk. Then you had some other boats. Um, there were steam driven for 50 or more passengers. It was the James Breslin, the Katie, the Nellie Price, and the Ermine. The Ermine is the boat that's pictured on this particular page. Ice boats were also very common as ice harvesting was a big business around 1900. In 1937, you had an outboard motor regatta. I think that um, uh, Tommy, uh, who owns the uh, Point Breeze Marine, actually has the original trophy for that. Then you had a trolley that would go from what's now at the visitor center, and it would take you to Caterers Park and Interlaken. And for five cents, you could reach the Trumpulous Hotel, Moon's Lake House, and Caterers Park. And you see the trolley on the bottom left, and on the bottom right, or on the right, rather, you can see the very first bridge going over Fish Creek. It says five miles per hour. That's a bridge that's been replaced twice now. <coughs> on, the, on the right here, you can see the second bridge, which has now been replaced uh, with the current bridge. But you had omnibuses, which carried passengers to the lake. It was an electric railroad from 1890 to 1910. It cost you 25 cents to go 24 miles. And then the railroad bridge, which you can see here, was built in 1881. If you ever go over by the boat works um, on, the, on the right side of the bridge, on the Fish Creek side, you can actually still see a lot of the pilings that formed that railroad bridge that's still there. In 1931, you had the road from Saratoga Springs to the lake was completed. The original way that you would get out there was actually Lake Avenue, because 9P wasn't really built. And at one point, um, when, you, when you were at Congress Park, or an incident now where uh, Mary Lou Whitney just built that beautiful new statue, um, that part of the road used to continue out there all the way towards the lake, but through Lake Gary, it was the direct shot as it is now. And now, on the picture here, you see the Pullman Palace Electric Car, which was owned by Tommy Luther, with a trailer at his white sulfur spring. It's quite an elaborate uh, car. So, some of the other activities you had was you had toboggan slides, and skating was very popular. There were boat parades. The, um, the priest would come out of the church and bless the fleet. Um, in the summer, you had fishing, swimming, picnicking, wall games, and fireworks. In cottages, the camp started to flourish. So here you can see the, um, the toboggan slide. On the left, you can see how people were dressed to go fishing. Imagine doing that today. And on the right, you can see people walking down the road that took the Caterers Park. So you had ice fishing, which is on the picture on the left. Um, over at uh, Luther Forest, uh, not Luther White Sulphur Spring in 1919, the Seagull was the first hydroplane on Saratoga Lake. <coughs> Believe it or not, they actually had horse trotting races on the lake in 1903. And here you can see um, this was done over by Newman's uh, Hotel, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But that was on Saratoga Spring side of the city. And um, you can see some of the articles about that, including the um, the results. Saratoga is um, sort of famous for a lot of the lake houses and then we're going to talk about next. In 1875, the White Sulphur Spring was a hotel and park took its name from the nearby spring. It accommodated 100 guests and could also be reached by a steamboat. We talked about earlier about 1,500 people, the Lady of the Lake. Other early hotels included Cedar Bluff and the New Crystal Lake at Fish Creek. Moon's Lake House opened in 1853 at the site where the former Loomis Lake House was. And then Frank Leslie's interstate interlinking the state with uh, what's now Crescent Avenue. Here you can 
can see some pictures of the White Silk Springs Hotel. Um, on, the, on the right side, you can see the spring, which now will get over Gulf 19, and you're going north from Kansas uh, toward the bridge. You'll see the remnants of it still on the right side. The hotel was raised in 1958, and the reason it was raised is because there was a lot of accidents, and they had to knock it down so they could straighten 19. Here are some, some other pictures of the White Sulphur Spring. You can see where the spring was in the hotel and the view from the lake at the bottom. Here are some pictures of when they were doing the construction of the hotel. You can see like your uh, antique uh, cement mixers. Some other pictures of it. The day sorry, we talked about how it was knocked down in 1958 so that they could straighten 9P. This is some interesting uh, information. On the right, you see. Um, Tommy Luther's um, license to operate the steamship Alice, and they have some things in there where they talk about the steamship line on the left. Here's some of the uh, mass memorabilia in my collection from, uh, from the White Soldier Spring Hotel. Boxing was big. At the White Sulphur Spring was the training camp of the uh, heavyweight champion of the world, Jack Dempsey. He had his own cottage, which is in the middle picture. You had Gene Tunney, Pancho Villa, Johnny Buff, Frank Moran, Knockout Brown, and Louise Perko. That's also Jack Dempsey on both the left and the right. He's with Pancho Villa in the picture of the right, he's the shorter person. Here's a picture of the boxing ring that was at White Sulphur Springs. Um, and then across on opposite Snake Hill, Gene uh, Daubry had his own training thing, which had people like uh, Kid McCoy, James Corbett, who was also a heavyweight champion, and Bob and Simmons. Of their era. This is really cool. The picture on the left is John L. Sullivan, who was the first bare knuckles uh, heavyweight champion of the world. And on the right, you actually see where he signed his name into the registry at the White Silver Spring Hotel. <laughs> so he was there in 1885. And then a lot of people know about Moon's Lake House. Here's an early picture, as I said earlier, before that there was Moon's Lake House. Here's um, some other pictures that did have a casino. One of the pictures, which is at the bottom here, is relatively rare, and it really um, shows that they had a separate building, which was a bowling alley. I hadn't seen many pictures of that until recently. And obviously, everybody knows about the invention of the potato chip. There's lots of stories, and I can talk about that for more than an hour. We can do that. There's a lot of different theories of how it was invented and where it was invented, a lot of these mythology. And um, basically, most people think that George Crumb Speck and his sister Katie Weeks and possibly their brother-in-law were all involved in this. And um, it happened at Moon's Lake House in 1853. Um, Carrie B. Moon was the owner of Moon's Lake House. He was sort of a uh, P.T. Barnum type of person who had to promote things. There are some other people who think there, there was a doctor um, in the UK who actually uh, published a cookbook in 1822 that shows the potato chip. But whether it was invented in Saratoga Springs or not, I think everybody agrees that it was really promoted and made famous in Saratoga Springs. And initially, I guess one of the interesting things is that your original name uh, generically wasn't the potato chip, but it was the Saratoga chip. <laughs> then we have the casino. So this was on the road to and on Saratoga Lake. So some of them were, you know, on was an IP, they weren't really all on the lake. A number of them were on the lake. But I tried to group them all together. And you had a very stylish restaurant with excellent uh, cuisine, with very famous um, orchestras and entertainers. We'll talk about a little bit more. And most of them also had casinos. Now the casinos generally didn't allow the locals to bet there because they didn't want the locals to lose uh, all their money. Um, but they I guess when I was doing my research, they were known for a lot of famous dishes, and some of them have disappeared. One of them in particular was hashed down in cream potatoes. And gambling really flourished here for about 30 years in the 1920s to the 50s, until it was shut down by Governor Dewey and uh, Senator uh, Fowler. Here's some of the owners that you can see. It's really the notorious uh, who's who of uh, organized crime. But you see people like Diamond, Joe Madonna, Larry Lansky, Dutch Schultz, Lucky Luciano, and Arthur Walsing. Many of you people who watched uh, Boardwalk Empire, you know a little bit about all these people, particularly 
for our philosophy was uh, reported to have fixed the uh, World Series, which is another full axon scandal. Here are some of the casinos, the Piping Rock, which uh, had a fiber in 1954, Riley's, uh, Smith's Interlake in the Brook, Mato in Chicago, the Club in the Meadowbrook. And a lot of times people used to say, sort of like Casablanca, I mean, there's gambling going on in the casino. Everybody pretended they didn't know they were there, but the Lions Club actually used to published a postcard that gave everybody an out. <laughs> Here's Newman's Lake House. This opened in 1871 and it closed a little over 100 years later when the roof collapsed. Um, it, it was also known as the College Inn and the Cardinals. Then you had some other things there. Well, Newman's, uh, another picture of a rambling white frame building with water verandas and a large capacity dining room. You had dancing, entertainment, and gambling, which was common in most of them. Here's some other shots of Newman's. Then you had Riley's, which wasn't on uh, Saratoga Lake, but nearby uh, Lake Lonely. It first burned in 1930, and they built a new one in 34. It was the last casino that actually came down. Very Art Deco, yellow stucco, and red uh, conical roof. It was torn down in the 1990s, originally, I guess, to build a nursing home, but then they ended up building some very high-end homes. It was owned by Louis Doc Perone. And again, you had you know, the same type of uh, profile in terms of top notch entertainment, dining, and family. It had very famous scenic murals, imposing chandelier, and draped ceiling. Here's an early picture of it. The Arrowhead Inn, which is um, at the end of Arrowhead, was built in 1899. It had a fire, and then they rebuilt it again, and it was destroyed a second time in 1969. And you can see a couple of different pictures of two different uh, versions of the hotel. In terms of the people who were guests and, and, and um, entertainers, it was really a who's who. Yeah. Um, you have people like Bean Crosby, and you had um, Amelia Earhart um, actually stayed here. Edith Piaf, which a lot of people didn't know. Baker Kugat, Jimmy Rose Lee, the Ramsey, um, Harry Grant. So it was quite a, a lot of people who came here. It was really the first <coughs> city at one point in time. The city itself had the two largest hotels in the world. So a lot of these people would come. And Picnic, clam bakes, people would have a lot of corporate outings there. Then later on, they opened a 
mention it to anybody, they always have a smile on their face. I guess it's a smile. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's a, it's a homeowners association with both townhouses and single family homes. Here's a picture when it was a, um, when it was just a place where they had an amphitheater. And this picture um, was taken from behind, so everybody's got their back to it. And then here's some pictures. This was a building on the top left that had a tower. <coughs> Beach. Um, it was a 12-acre property. Amos and Harold Brown bought it in 1935 and later on they sold it. Um, Robert Morris, who operated a lot in the glory days, he had an arcade, a new ride, snack bar, a restaurant, public beach, and campgrounds. Um, there was actually a water ski school there, the only natural beach on the lake. It was purchased uh, at one point for a controversial resort, which was never built. The town of Steelwater purchased it and it has now restored public access. Now what you have here is Doc Brown's and Veneto's Power Sports. And um, this, uh, this winter we had like for one of the very first winter fest here. We had motorcycle races and a lot of other activities that we helped promote. Here's some photos of Brown's Beach in its uh in its Florida days. Here's some other photos. You can see the thing on the right is the ski school. Some other attractions. Caterers Club, which was the old style of mansion which was near the current Waterfront Park. It was a social club whose members were politicians, Tammany Hall, and the Pollock Club. Pop Nickerson was a very famous person when you could take the trolley, you could get in there, he had this place and called it the wall, W-A-L-L-E-D, Walk Astoria. And you could, he had a pet sitting there that he would uh, spur his all kinds of advice. It was a famous uh, camp for the boys, and then uh, Jet Rock was protested nearby in Luther. When I was doing my uh, research, I found this uh, music, the Saratoga Lake Waltz. And if, if nobody could find a recording, Walter Suckley, who was a board member of the Saratoga Lake Association, you now got the Union College Orchestra to play it. So just a quick treat, let me let you hear a little bit of it.
1986, the state formed this taxing jurisdiction that was in, comprised of the four municipalities that uh, make up the uh, homeowners around the lake. And um, they basically uh, negotiated a drawdown with the hydroelectric company that allows for the regattas to take place uh, in terms of when they lower the lake. And they harvest milk oil and pond weeds and do a lot of other great work. As far as the Saratoga Lake Association, uh, this past year we did a boat safety course, we do adopt the highway and roadside cleanups, we have well attended uh, holiday and summer cocktail parties, chestnut leaf poles, uh, we promoted the winter fest, we had the first annual polar plunge, paddle fest, uh, she jumps paddle, which is uh, trying to encourage uh, women and girls to get out on the lake and they um, do the stand of paddles. We had a ring of fire. Um, our newsletter, Shorelines, was named the number one newspaper for all the lakes in New York State. And we just, not too long ago, uh, started a Facebook page and we're up to over 640 likes already. Um, some of the other things we've done is we tried to do liaisons, which is sort of one of the reasons uh, that this is being successful today, hopefully. Um, but we, we uh, improved the relationship with the dam operator. Part, we sponsor part of the lake steward program where they go in at the boat launch and they inspect the boats to make sure they're not carrying invasive species from other lakes. Um, we're part of the Water Quality Control Committee for the county. Uh, we collaborate with the Friends of the Caterers, the Sailing uh, Club, the Rowing Association, the Lake Lonely Association. We have a dialogue with uh, the SRA about accommodations so when they have these large regattas that boat owners and fishermen still have the ability sandbox, which is there the lake. Um, we've been involved with public access to the lake. Uh, I was appointed to the mayor's uh, uh, centennial commission at the waterfront park, and I've also been involved with the Browns Beach opening, and we're members of various things, uh, chambers, and we also um, help uh, with respect to a lot of media, newspaper, and, uh, and uh, magazine articles. Um, our our uh, membership share is due to fame. I left some um, membership things. It's $20 a year to join, and we have a special right now. If you join now, you get the rest of this year, plus all the next year, $20, and that's per person. Um, a lot of people to thank, I put them all on here for this presentation, <laughs> but to be uh, possible about all the people. I see Sean is here today, I want to thank him, and he, those beautiful uh, words that are up there, he had done a presentation earlier, um, and so he loaned those so we could share them with you today. And then I guess there's a lot of people saying, well, I think, think Terry and Victoria were always, always in my corner helping me out for everything. And um, particularly, I want to thank um, Sarah Cole and Walter Subley of the Creative Advantage, who um, I have a very, very large um, collection of memorabilia. Uh, they scanned everything, and a lot of what you saw here um, was the result of all their efforts, and a lot of other people helped. So again, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, I know that we publicized this for an hour, um, which is a little, we ran over a little bit. Um, and, and again, the point was overview. We have a lot of interest. We could always drill down in the future and do another thing. But if people need to leave, we understand. If people want to stay and ask some questions, we'd be happy to address them. So thank you all very much.